Hello and welcome to episode 51 of the Motivational Millennial Podcast. Today we are speaking with Coyote Peterson, who is freaking amazing. He has really great energy and is a master of the animal kingdom. You may have seen some of his videos floating around. The guy getting stung by a bullet ant is one. The guy with the adorable baby sloth is another. (laughs) But Coyote was a really great conversation. And actually, I was first introduced to him by the bullet ant video because my best friend Chelsea and I were planning to go to Costa Rica and she said, okay, watch this video and know that we need to not get stung by one of these while we're in Costa Rica. And I just was watching him and I was like, this man has no fear. He is so awesome. And luckily, while I was in Costa Rica, I did not get stung by any bullet ants, but I did have a transformational experience of my own. I came back feeling a very renewed sense of purpose and wanting to help people live the most fully expressed version of themselves and to really be present with their experience of life. And one of the ways I have the privilege of doing that is through coaching and a coaching relationship in which I get to support someone one-on-one in that exploration, that self-awareness deepening, and also releasing the negative limiting beliefs or negative thoughts that can get in the way of them actually achieving their goals and living a fulfilling life. So if this is something that you are interested in exploring, I'd love to offer you a free sample session that would be around 30 minutes long. If you're interested, you can go to motivationalmillennial.com slash Ivy sample, or you can shoot me an email at Ivy at motivationalmillennial.com and ask me any kind of questions you have, and we can start the ball rolling then. So without further ado, actually, I said that, but there is more ado. (laughs) (laughs) Let me tell you about all this ado. (laughs) All this ado. (laughs) Please stay tuned after the interview for when Blake and I will share our biggest takeaways in the after show. And now, without further ado, Coyote Peterson. Let's get gritty. And welcome to the Motivational Millennial Podcast, where we talk with inspiring members of the millennial generation who are living life with a sense of purpose and achieving their dreams. I'm Ivy LeClaire. And I'm Blake Brandis. Our Motivational Millennial guest today is Coyote Peterson. Coyote is an avid adventurer and animal expert who hosts the Brave Wilderness Channel and the Emmy award-winning show Breaking Trail. Since childhood, animals have played a huge role in his life. Every one of them, from the bizarre to the deadly, have led him on countless pursuits to understand their true nature and develop an appreciation for the incredible habitats they call home. His goal is to make animal conservation and education entertaining for the next wave of explorers and to further promote compassion and welfare for the natural world through the curiosity it provokes. Thank you so much for being here today, Coyote. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I'm excited to be a part of the Millennial Podcast. Woohoo! Well, we'd love to hear more about what you're up to at the moment and what you love about it. Sure. Well, we are diving into 2017 with some really exciting content for the Brave Wilderness Channel. I am actually less than 48 hours away from hopping on an airplane and heading down to Florida to do a little bit of warm-up filming for the year. We film in Florida quite a bit just because it's a location that we're very comfortable with. You know, we've been doing some aquatic stuff recently, and for a while now, everybody's been wondering, well, where are all the bites and stings? I mean, we haven't seen anything <laughs> since the bullet ant. Is that all that you're going to give us? No, 2017. Is going to be a whopper, and uh, oh starting gosh. off with me being stung by the lionfish, which is an invasive species in Florida now, and people are getting stung by it all the time. And from mm. what I hear, it is extremely painful. So about a week from today, I will be down there snorkeling for lionfish and probably getting stung by one. So stay tuned for that. Wow. So what is your inspiration for doing this? Like, what is that experience like to allow yourself to be stung by all these painful creatures? And I mean, you, I have seen a couple of videos. And and you're like, man, you got to go immediately to the ground. And it's like, find your Zen. But I don't know what the experience is like <laughs> for you. But 
<laughs> well, what's crazy about the bite and sting phenomenon, as I guess it's kind of become at this point, it's kind of a double-edged sword or double-edged stinger, if you will. <laughs> you know, it certainly has helped our channel grow significantly over the course of the past year. And from, you know, our standpoint of educating people and dispelling a lot of myths about animals you may be afraid of. And of course, just to share with you the experience of what it's like for a human to actually be stung by one of these creatures mm. provides a lot of insight that we hope ultimately encourages people to just admire these animals from a safe distance. You know, then of course, when you look at it from Coyote's perspective, where it's like, oh no, I got to get bitten and stung by more things. <laughs> you know, I have a fairly high pain tolerance. And as soon as my producers kind of figured this out, we're like, I'm getting scratched up by snapping turtles and bit by non-venomous snakes and just kind of like, you know, trudging it, you know, kind of scuffing it off and being like, oh, that's no problem. They're like, well, how much further can we go with this? <laughs> and then it just kind of took on a whole new life. And, you know, I'm happy to do it, though. And we research ahead of time before we perform any of these bite and sting episodes to make sure that, you know, there's proper medical staff either behind the cameras or that we have notified local medical experts that something like this is being done and everybody should be on call in the event that my body does have a negative reaction to a venom or a poison. Has your self-perception changed about what you're doing as the bite and sting phenomenon has become that much more popular? Maybe a little bit. I guess the thing that's changed a lot for me is that I was never a person that intended to be in front of the camera. I was always striving to be behind the camera. I went to school for film and television production, directing and screenwriting. So, you know, as we started developing these shows, originally we were thinking, oh, cool, well, let's cast somebody as like an animal adventurer. And we struggled at that for a number of years, just A, being able to find somebody that would willing to commit at the time on absolutely zero dollars when it came to a budget to commit a life to doing this. And then, of course, somebody that was actually able to get up close with animals, which I've always been good at. And, you know, we did this for a while and I was kind of like, you know, you might just need to get in front of the camera for this. And, you know, my nickname's Coyote and it had been since I was eight years old. And, you know, my team just kind of looked at it as like, you know, this is fate. This is what we have to do. And as it's gotten bigger and more successful, you know, for me, I guess it's just the opportunity continues to present itself with being able to educate and provide this animal edutainment, as we call it, for the next generation. And, you know, I could be out somewhere getting pizza with my daughter and I'll have four or five people come up to me saying that they watch the shows and wanting to take pictures and that they're excited about animals and getting outside to explore. And it's because of the shows that we've created. And for us, I think at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. How did you get the nickname Coyote when you were eight? Yeah, that's a great question. I love telling that one because it's, you know, something that you never thought would catch up with you later on in life. And <laughs> my mom used to take my sister and I out west. We would travel across the country in an old suburban and it was pulling a trailer and we would stop all across the United States, you know, Yellowstone. We spent time in South Dakota, all pretty much the entire United States we traveled. But then we would end up and always stay in Arizona for a couple of weeks. And there was a lizard species there called a regal horn lizard, and they were very difficult to find because they're very well camouflaged. But a bird called a roadrunner oftentimes would feed on horn lizards. So I started following the roadrunners around thinking that they would lead me to a horn lizard and before the roadrunner eat the horn lizard, I would try to scare it off and then catch the horn lizard. Now, keep in mind, this philosophy never worked. Like, I never actually <laughs> followed the roadrunner and found a horn lizard. But my mom would watch me doing this. And, like, I would just be like, I got to go out in the backyard and try to find some horn lizards. And she would, like, just sit on the back porch watching me <laughs> shake these roadrunners around. And she started calling me her little coyote because, like, Wiley Coyote in the Warner Brothers cartoon, the coyote was always chasing the roadrunners. So, you know, if I was outside playing street baseball with my neighbors and stuff like that, and it was time for dinner, she'd yell, Coyote, it's time for dinner. Some of my neighborhood friends would be like, oh, Nick Coyote, time for dinner. <laughs> it was just this nickname that kind of hung on. And, you know, I got to high school and you start wanting to play sports and dating girls and doing those teenager things. And I certainly abandoned the nickname at the time, but it came around full circle. And, you know, now I can't go anywhere without being known as Coyote at this point. Yeah, I was curious because I assumed that it was not your given name. And, you know, I'm curious to know, I guess, so you released the nickname for a little bit and then took on this shift in identity, essentially, you know, putting Coyote on. So what was that like, you know, taking on this new? <laughs> 
Yeah, once I got to high school, you know, I mean, well, my real name's Nathaniel and my nickname was Nate. And, you know, once I started playing like basketball and baseball, like I just would introduce myself as Nate. But, you know, the kids in my neighborhood, you know, and the kids that I grew up with that knew me as Coyote playing in, in the ponds and swamps behind the house, you know, that didn't really transcend into later grade school and then high school. So, you know, I wasn't exactly running around in high school being like, hey, guys, by the way, I used to have this nickname Coyote. Anybody want to call me that? <laughs> you know, when my producing team found out about this, because, you know, showcasing Nathaniel Peterson, host of the Brave Wilderness Channel, it's like, or Nate, like, you know, Nate might as well be Matt or Bill or, you know, and then not that they're <laughs> great names, they, they certainly are. But when you're creating a brand and you want a character that, you know, people are going to remember, the name Coyote just made a lot of sense. And, you know, I had a, a cool backstory and, and the whole production team was like, oh, yeah, we have to go with this. People, you know, and of course, you know, I owe a little bit of credit to Bear Grylls as well, because at the time, Man vs. Wild was extremely extremely popular and people remembered the name Bear. Bear's real name is Edward and his story is that his sister couldn't say Edward as a kid and started calling him Teddy and that transcended into Bear. So, you know, those animal nicknames at the time just became very popular and obviously it stuck. So does it feel like Coyote Peterson is like, I don't know, like a role that you're playing or is it like an identity that you now just associate with all of the time? Or what was that shift like going from being known primarily as Nate to primarily as Coyote? There's virtually no difference between, you know, office Nate or Coyote and, you know, Coyote that you see in front of the camera. I mean, mm. my personality stays exactly the same. I, I oftentimes tell people I'm like a 10-year-old in a 35-year-old's body. I mean, <laughs> it's been a big kid. I still have toys in my house, like toys like dinosaurs and rubber animals. My daughter collects all these things. Like our entire house looks like, you know, it's a museum of sorts. So <laughs> I kind of refuse to grow up in a certain sense. Therefore, my personality has been the same. And I guess it's just evolved from maybe a maturity standpoint in some senses when it comes to the business side of things for, you know, our brand. But I certainly think it's my younger seeming personality that transcends across the camera. Uh, that I think really gets our audience, you know, connected with me and feeling like I'm like a big brother, you know, or I'm the guy next door that's like, hey, this guy knows some stuff about animals and goes on these crazy adventures. Well, we kind of want to be a part of that, too. So I think it kind of works out. Yeah, that enthusiasm and that sense of wonder really is infectious. So I love that you share that through your work. And you have mentioned your team a couple times. I'm curious, how did you get connected? You mentioned studying film and production in college. Can you take us through that transition into where you are now? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you the abridged version, which is, you know, I went to school at the Ohio State University, started a film project there with a bunch of friends that ultimately led us in a direction where we wanted to produce independent films. And I actually spent a number of years out of college once I graduated pursuing the financing for some screenplays that I had written. And I actually got really close a couple of times to getting the funding, but, you know, typical Hollywood story, you know, something falls apart last minute and you don't end up getting the money. And we then ended up starting to think, well, maybe we could go a direction that's television. And, you know, this is where all of the kind of, oh, I was into animals came around full circle. And everybody that I was working with at the time were all students that had graduated around the same time as me from Ohio State. And my entire team today is made of people that I've known for over a decade that were all film and video backgrounds with their degrees. So, you know, we just have banded together as we kind of consider ourselves a sports team in a sense. And we banded together and have just continued pressing forward through all the doors that have been closed to us when it came to getting, whether it was an independent film deal or a, a television deal, until we ultimately landed up in the digital space between Discovery Digital Networks, where we started off, and now today to be, you know, this growing channel on YouTube. And it's truly a dream come true. What would you say is the biggest dream that you've achieved so far and in what ways did you have to grow to achieve it? That's a good question, man. There's two ways to answer it. There's one that's from the creator standpoint where as a writer and a director and somebody that always wanted to be behind you know, the camera that – you want people to see your work, right? And you hope that one day you'll make something that either 
gets onto a screen that somebody more than just your friends and family see, right? And then there's also the side of things where you're the person in front of the camera and you hope that your performance engages an audience and gets people's attention and that they enjoy what it is that you're presenting to them. And whether it's animals or it's a scene that somebody's written that you're acting out, which, you know, what we do is complete improv when we're on locations. There's no scripts to anything that we do. And it's rewarding from both standpoints to realize that dream that people are not only watching what it is we're creating from behind the scenes and behind the camera, but also what is being put in front of the camera. So I get to kind of enjoy in the spoils from both sides of things, I guess. Hmm. Do you like the improv aspect? I mean, have you done scripted work in the past? And if so, how does that compare to being on location and just letting it evolve naturally? No, I have never a day in my life acted, so to speak. Um, Never took acting classes or anything like that. It's just complete improv, given that we do a lot of research ahead of time. And I'm so fascinated by every animal that's out there. And I do so much research on my own when we're not on location. Just I still love to go to the library and I'll just check out 20 books at a time and flip through them, look at the pictures, read little bits and pieces of facts here and there. And I just get excited about going out there to look for these creatures. I mean, it is like a constant treasure hunt. You know, I'm like, I'm so excited to get on an airplane on Friday and get to Florida because we're exploring some new areas that we haven't been before. I mean, even getting to go out to search for a lionfish, which of course then is I have to get stung by <laughs> that it's that treasure hunt of going to look for one of these animals and then appreciating not only the environment but also the animal itself I mean these complex organisms that are making up these wonderful ecosystems that really is what drives me and then the performance aspect of it I honestly think it's just natural me talking and you know sometimes we'll cut the cameras and we'll have to do something a second time and sometimes I do flub lines or mess up on things and of course we can edit around certain aspects of that in post production but once those cameras roll and we've gotten close to or I've I've managed to catch an animal and get it in front of the cameras we just roll and we just let it go and as long as I've done research in advance I usually do a pretty good job of getting all those facts out there. I mean, even as you're talking about the process right now, your energy level has gotten greater and you just sound really excited just talking (laughs) about it. So I imagine it's very natural. Yeah, that's kind of the thing why we realized, you know, after developing the show that, well, maybe I need to be the one that's in front of the camera because I had all this energy behind the camera of what I was I was looking for. And we're like, why don't you get in front of the camera and do this? And, and I realized that I was actually my directing was becoming the performance. And then it was like, all right, we started, you know, shopping to some television networks and they were like, we want to see what it is that you're doing, your personality in front of the camera. And if you're the one catching the animals and bringing them to the host it should be you that's just doing the whole thing, right? So, you know, it made sense. And then once those light bulbs click on, it's kind of all working in harmony at that point. What's your mindset like when you're out there? I'd imagine it takes some time to find some of these animals. Do you just have a certain way of dealing with being patient? What's that experience like for you? It is tough. And actually with, you know, the evolution of the Brave Wilderness content, which, you know, this is a little sneak peek for people listening. Some of our content is going to evolve into a state that is more of like the documentary behind the scenes stuff, because we're really finding that people are interested in the journey and the search that it takes to find some of these creatures. I mean, we will spend, you watch an episode of Breaking Trail, it's like, oh, cool. This is nine minutes of of animal content. You guys must just walk out the door and there it is. It just happens. (laughs) It can take days sometimes to find things. So that's why I say it's like a treasure hunt. And where I get, you know, have the most excitement is you wake up in the morning, the alarms go off, it's 530, it's still dark out, you get out onto location, you say, okay, well, we have a list of maybe 25 different things we could come across today. Let's keep our fingers crossed that we find at least one or two things. And then we've got some content. And once those cameras start rolling, you know, we don't just film ourselves walking around aimlessly, we usually hold off until we actually come across something that can be filmed. And, you know, some episodes you'll see like all of a sudden the cameras do just start running and you didn't expect it. And then it's just like run and gun until I can catch the animal or until we can get close to it. And that process that we go through is 
I say arduous in the sense that it's difficult and we will go, you know, 14, sometimes 18 hours in a day with, you know, just eating granola bars out of our backpacks. And you'll have days where you're getting soaked by torrential rain or it's scorching hot in the desert or, you know, you just aren't coming across anything because it's too hot out and the animals are all hiding in the shade. So every day and every location and every time that we go out to capture content, it's a little bit different than the last. This just sounds so odd. Like that literally was going through my mind is, wow, that sounds really awesome. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, so appreciative of the dedication and work that you and your team are putting into it, because this wouldn't be created. We wouldn't be having this conversation right now if you'd given up, you know, the first few times that it was like, okay, we've been trying to look for this for two days, like we're going to give up. And so, you know, so much gratitude for that as well. Well, you know, one thing that a lot of people probably don't notice that, you know, I appreciate from somebody that came from behind the camera, right? It's my team. And a lot of times I get, you know, a lot of people, oh man, we love your show. You do such a great job. And that's always very flattering. I love that people enjoy my performance, but the work that, you know, Mark and Mario and Chance do behind the scenes on the cameras, like you watch some of these episodes, like these focus pulls that they're getting and just their ability to keep stuff in frame, like you have to realize the environments we are in are brutal. I mean, we are getting covered in bugs. You are in mud. You are in water. You are tired. It's not like walking into a closed set for a movie and you've got craft services tents and anything <laughs> like that. It's like we literally sometimes are so exhausted. It, you know, water bottles will be covered in mud and we're like, oh my gosh, how much dirty jungle water has gotten into this water bottle? Okay, it doesn't matter. Just drink it anyways. Hopefully nothing <laughs> oh bad gosh. happens. Like It's pretty grueling in the fact that wow. my team manages to get all of this on camera is incredible. And then, of course, you get into post-production and my editing team, Ryan and Chris, they just, I mean, they're crushing it nonstop, day after day, cutting these episodes together. And I think that's one thing that's really gripped our audience is to have a YouTube show that we're really aiming to be on the production level quality that is television at this point. It is really incredible quality. Kudos for that. And Thank you. how do you all support each other as a team? Because I'd imagine there's some days when you are exhausted or, you know, one of your teammates is just hasn't gotten any sleep or you're all out there and just it's been the 18 hours and you're covered mm-hmm. in mud and sweaty. How do you support <laughs> each other in those environments? I mean, it's tough. And when you're on location with a team for, you know, two weeks straight and you're tired and, you know, you've been bitten up by bugs. I mean, it's funny. We have this contest when we come back to the offices after production where everybody will like put out their arms and legs say okay who has the most cut scrapes bug bites bruises <laughs> all those things we get pretty beat up on these trips you know me usually more so than anybody just because i'm also taking bites and stings for you know the cameras but that sports team mentality that we try to keep and i know that you know as the guy in front of the camera it's always important to tell everybody behind the scenes that they're doing an incredible job. And even when you're getting rained on or it's sweaty or it's scorching hot, you just have to think that the reason we're doing this is because of all those kids out there that are waiting for Tuesday and Friday morning to roll around at 9 a.m. when they're going to get to see the next episode. And trust me, it's tough. There are instances where we've almost given up on episodes. We actually have one coming out, I think, in about two weeks about this giant freshwater prawn that we caught in Costa Rica. It was one of the most difficult, adventurous episodes we've ever filmed. And spoiler alert, at the end of the episode, I finally catch this enormous prawn. I mean, this thing's like a mini lobster. And right in the middle of the scene, it's holding onto this fishing net. And I try to dip it in the water to get it to let go of the net and it gets out of my hand and it escapes. So it's what we kind of consider like one of these, not a failed episode, but not an episode that went according to plan. And it's cool. You know, we were like, oh my gosh, do we even get the episode? We thought it was going to be completely scrapped. But, you know, like I said, our phenomenal post-production team managed to turn it into this epic adventure. (laughs) And it's a real cool experience for the audience to see that things don't always always go according to plan. And even sometimes Coyote lets go or loses an animal and we don't get the proper outro the way that we plan for it. So um, it's fun and we just keep in good spirits and everybody just remembers that this is for the audience. That's why we do this at the end of the day. So which of your accomplishments has surprised you the most? Like when you look back at it, you're like, oh my gosh, can't believe I did that or that that happened. 
If I were to have to pick one single episode, it would probably be what we did with Phantom of the Wilderness, which was the short film Wolverine episode that we did the end of last year. The Wolverine has been one of my favorite animals since I was a little kid, and we literally scraped and saved for pretty much since we'd started our YouTube channel to be able to finance a trip to Alaska, where we were fortunate enough to work with the only human on the western side of the world that successfully has bred and has wolverines in captivity. I mean, he has a wildlife sanctuary where he cons- you know, promotes a lot of conservation for these animals and also rehabilitates and then releases animals back out into the wild. And he said, well, I've got a wolverine that is used to me and you guys can come up here and film with it. Well, we didn't quite get across what we wanted to do through our phone conversations. And when we got there to Alaska, he thought we just wanted to photograph the wolverine. And we were like, no, 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 no. Not photograph as in photos. Photograph as as in, I need to be in an enclosure with this Wolverine off of its harness. Like, I wanted to be the first show host to ever do this. Steve about had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we totally put him on the spot with the cameras and I ultimately convinced him to train me. And we spent significant time with him training me on what it is that he knew, which ultimately culminated in me being able to enter an enclosure with this Wolverine. I made a connection with the animal. He said it was unlike anything he has ever seen in all of his years working with Wolverines and animals. The connection that I made with this animal in a matter of two days. And this was a hodgepodge of footage. I mean, we shot, I think there was something close to eight and a half hours worth of footage that then we ended up editing down into our largest episode ever. It was 30 minutes long, which premiered the day after Thanksgiving and became immediately the number one trending episode in the world. It was probably aside from like one of our bite and sting episodes, the single greatest success we have ever had from filming standpoint, a dream accomplishment, and then the audience welcoming it with open arms and loving what it was that we created. So yeah, when I look back our career so far, the Wolverine episode is kind of the greatest we've ever created. Wow. Congratulations. That is epic. And it's just making me feel like Jurassic World, like trying to tame the Velociraptor, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not to go like too deep into it, but I wonder if you could just give us like a quick feel, like how do you forge a connection in two days with a Wolverine? Like, what is that like? Honestly, Steve had a big part to do with it. And if you, I don't know if you guys have seen that episode, but if you haven't, go back and watch it. I had to walk barefoot in the Alaskan wilderness for a significant amount of time and actually stayed barefoot my entire trip there or most of my trip there afterward. The episode, we kind of combined the content to make it seem like it's all within, you know, an eight hour perspective that we filmed this. And it was actually filmed over the course of two days. A lot of my training happened within the first day and some of the stuff we shot on the second day had to do with like location B-roll and additional shots and stuff like that. But Steve really kind of, you know, put me through the eye of a needle in a matter of eight hours to get me up close with this animal. And it was really his training and his insight to having worked with these animals for 30 years at this point. I mean, he is the Wolverine whisperer and he has been working with these animals since way back in the days when Walt Disney was making animal films. And Steve was the original animal person on all of those Disney films that worked behind the scenes with the animals. So he had a lot of knowledge to share with me when it came to communicating with mammals specifically. Specifically. And I guess that is what really gave me the confidence at the end of the day, once Steve was okay with it, for me to get into that enclosure. And to our knowledge, I'm the first show host to ever get into an enclosure with an unharnessed wolverine. And it's a very, very dangerous animal if it wants to be. Their ability to bite a prey animal like a moose, hold on to its neck, crush its esophagus, and then bring it to the ground in a matter of seconds is pretty impressive for an animal that only weighs about 40 pounds. Wow. I mean, were you nervous or were you just like, no, nah, I've got this because of all the other, you know, what was that? the moment I was, before? I think Steve was more nervous than I was because <laughs> I was just so excited to be in the presence of this Wolverine. And the thing that people probably don't realize is that there is very little Wolverine footage in the episode. The amount of time that we got to spend with BAMP, which is the Wolverine's name, was I think maybe about 20 minutes. That was all the time we had because literally Steve took it out of its enclosure, introduced me to it. It made what Steve felt was a connection in that it didn't immediately rip my face off. (laughs) 
I don't want to do this, but we'll go into the enclosure, but you have to listen to me. And no matter what happens, the moment I say, get out of the enclosure, get out of the enclosure. And there was a moment where the Wolverine lost its attention from the slab of moose ribs that we had in there with us. And its attention drew to me and it lunged at me. And I kind of jump backwards and he's like, get out, get out, get out, get out. And then he was distracting the Wolverine. And, um, you know, the Wolverine is very comfortable with him, but certainly from Steve's standpoint, the worry would be that if this Wolverine latched onto me, it would be a very, very bad situation. So, you know, we pushed it as far as we could. We listened to Steve. Steve said, that's it. We called the scene and boom, you get to the end of the episode. And it was pretty cool. Do you feel like your relationships or understanding of humans has changed significantly since you've been exploring and researching and spending so much time with animals? Um, in the regard of like working with other people who know a lot about animals or just my, you know, connection to animals, my relationship with animals? I'm thinking mainly of has your understanding of how humans behave, how we think, has that been influenced by all of your knowledge and research on the animal world in general? One comment that we oftentimes get on some of our videos is people want to know, you know, I'll catch a rattlesnake or a snapping turtle or, you know, any creature that I can actually be hands on with. Obviously, you can't do that with a mammal. Connecting with a mammal or a bird is something far different than a reptile or an amphibian. And then, of course, insects and arachnids are just kind of these little aliens. I don't know what sort of personalities they have, but even at the end of the day, they have their own as well. But with things like reptiles and amphibians, like I like to feel that I do truly connect with them. And that has to do with the way that I present myself to the animal. You know, when I catch something, I try to be as gentle as I possibly can. I will talk to that animal off camera. I will make sure that it's being handled gently so that it does not feel that it is going to be injured. Now, any animal, if it's approached by anything. A human is a predator. And for an animal, it's just like, uh oh, this is this is strange. I better get out of here. And then if it's caught, it's immediately thinking I'm going to be eaten. So after those first few minutes where it's like, wait a minute, no teeth, no claws, no pain receptors going off. This is just different. Okay, I'm going to chill out. I'm going to conserve my energy. And then when it's time to go, I'm going to bolt and get out of here. I mean, I experienced that with a lot of different animals, specifically reptiles and amphibians. But my connection with them, I think, has to do with just keeping myself calm, keeping the crew calm, talking in an excited matter, yet a contained matter that's not like flailing the animal around. You'll notice that I try to keep my hands as still as possible whenever presenting an animal. A, you don't want to move the animal around a whole lot. And then B, of course, the cameras need you to stay still so the guys that are shooting the tight macro shots can actually get in there. And, and keep a good focus. But when it comes to what I hope that people take away from our shows, it's that a lot of these animals, you don't need to be afraid of them. Now, I always tell the audience, never replicate what you see me doing. Certainly not with something like a bite or a sting. And even when it comes to catching animals, a toad or a frog, yes, that's something safe. But snakes have the potential to be venomous. Many arachnids are venomous. It's just always best to admire these animals for a, from a safe distance. But to know in the back of your mind, that these animals don't want to attack you. They're always more afraid of you than you should ever be of them. So your phone has that zoom in function. You don't have to get super close. Just zoom in a little bit and you're going to get a great shot. And then everybody, yourself, your friends, your family, and the animal itself will stay completely safe. As you were describing what it's like when you catch certain reptiles and after like they're immediately reacting like oh my gosh i'm in danger but then you know after a few minutes they can be like okay i'm calming down a little bit this is what's really happening it's totally reminding me of the lizard brain <laughs> and the amygdala <laughs> you know that's what people call it the lizard brain and this is like an exact mm -hmm. example of what that is where in humans there's that protection part of your brain where you're like immediately reacting to the situation and then you're like okay is this okay? This is actually okay. I can do this. You know, and that's like what's actually happening in these right. animals. Well, the whole flight, fight and flight mentality, you know, an animal's first instinct is always to run. And the only time an animal will ever get aggressive is if it's been cornered or it's been captured. And, you know, a snapping turtle is a perfect example. It's an animal that I really started my career with. It's one of my favorite animals in the world. And they are incredibly aggressive. But if you just see a snapping turtle in the 
wild in the water, you can be in the water with a snapping turtle and it, it wants nothing to do with you. It's not going to come up and bite you because it's an angry, snappy turtle. The only reason it's going to get aggressive is if you pick it up and take it out of the water and it's trying to defend itself because it's afraid that it's going to be eaten. So any animal uh, certainly has the right to defend itself, especially if a human's going to get close to it. So I always just say, admire something from a safe distance and you'll be just fine. Coyote, what's the most significant challenge you faced so far, either personal or animal? And what was it like to overcome that challenge? Well, I guess, you know, the challenges, I'll start with the animal aspect first. The animal challenges for us as a production team usually have to do with finding the animals themselves. You know, when it comes to catching an animal, a lot of these captures are difficult. Sometimes there are things that I don't end up being able to catch. Um, Sometimes we show those things. Sometimes we don't if it's a complete you know, fail. And it's like, oh, that animal just got away so quickly. It's not even worth showing to anybody. Great examples. We've got an episode coming out on Friday about a frog, believe it or not, the largest frog species in Costa Rica, which is called the smoky jungle frog. This frog has eluded me for, for four trips now, four times we've gone to Costa Rica and I've not been able to catch this frog. I've seen the frog, but they're just so fast and so strong. I haven't been able to actually nab one. And we finally did it on our last trip. And that episode comes out on Friday. It's really exciting for a frog episode. And we're excited to share that with the audience. And it's a challenge. Anytime that you know, you're know you presented with the concept of go out and catch an animal, it's really difficult from a business perspective and what it is that we do behind the scenes and just creating a career in the entertainment industry and specifically something that has grown, you know, extremely quickly on YouTube. The challenge has been sticking with it because we were always told, no, you can't do that. Or uh, it's a cool idea, but, you know, well, we don't have the budget to support that. Or, you know, people just aren't really interested in a single host presenting animals anymore. And, you know, I've heard every excuse as to why I shouldn't be doing this. And very few people that, you know, were in the entertainment industry, so to speak, that said, oh, yes, we see the vision. Let's make this happen. And there are a handful of individuals and they know who they are that are out there that did see the promise of what this was. And I think we were all pretty surprised to see how fast it actually grew. How did you maintain your belief in those times when people were telling you that it wouldn't be possible? I just always kind of knew once I got into college that I wanted to tell stories. Like I said, I wanted to be a director. I wanted to be a screenwriter. I wanted to share a creative vision with an audience. I never knew that I would be in front of the camera. And then once I realized that I needed to be in front of the camera, all of those cylinders kind of hit and the vehicle took off. And I knew that the most important thing at the end of the day was following my dreams, my vision, and to have my friends and family be the ones that were incredibly supportive and saying, we know you're going to make it at this no matter what happens and we're with you. That's what kept me going. And as soon as we got our break and got our foot in the door at Discovery Digital Networks and our first episode started coming out, like we were really nervous, you know, and Discovery actually kind of primed us to say, you know, you're going to have a lot of people out there that are really not going to like the show and you get a lot of hate mail and, and this and that. And, you know, I'm very proud to say that our YouTube, you know, positive rating is about, I think it's like 97.3% positive rating, which is like astronomically high for a YouTube channel. And what we owe that to is all of the kids, all of the families, whether you're five years old or 85 years old and you're watching our show, if you like animals, there's a good chance you're going to like our show. And that is truly what keeps us going at the end of the day and why this was so important to us. Once the first hundred people subscribed to our channel and we got positive comments like, this is amazing. This is what we've been missing. Keep it up it keeps us up. You know what I mean? We just keep going because we know the audience is out there and we get to share these adventures with them every single week. That's incredible. What an awesome gift, both for yourself and for the audience as well. What advice would you like to give to other millennials who are on a journey toward fulfillment and success? I kind of grew up in this incredible time where computers and camera technology and the internet have evolved the entertainment industry. You know, I still wish I could shoot something on 35 millimeter film someday, and maybe I will at some point. But the fact that our camera technology has advanced, it allows people who thought they couldn't make it 
in a field of entertainment to make it in this field. It doesn't take anything more than a GoPro camera and a small little Canon video camera to go out and make your own adventure show or make a show about cooking or a show about makeup or fashion or home decorating. It doesn't matter what it is. A platform like YouTube allows people to share their creative vision with the world now. And it's something that we love. And, you know, I promote YouTube on my own accord. You know, YouTube doesn't come to me and say, hey, would you guys kind of promote us in what it is you're doing? I tell everybody that I talk to that YouTube is what has allowed us to reach this level of success. And it's something that's there for everybody. And without a platform like this, we would probably still be spinning our wheels trying to get a TV show. And people often want to know, well, Coyote, when are we going to see it on TV? And I'm not saying that a TV show won't happen at some point in time. But right now, with our ability to reach our audience and to have creative control of the content that we're making and for me to be able to go out into an environment and get as excited as I do about finding animals and knowing that it doesn't matter if an executive wants to learn about a smoky jungle frog. I want the audience to learn about a smoky jungle frog and YouTube loves it. And YouTube never writes me and says, Ooh, you know what? Maybe we could do something with like a Komodo dragon instead of a smoky jungle frog. And trust me, <laughs> I want to do Komodo dragon too, but every animal is fair game and that's what makes it exciting. I think you're like a science teacher's dream. You know? <laughs> they're, like, they're like, you have these like vision, like, oh, I want to find a jungle frog. And then you just go out and do it. I love yeah. that initiative. That's so awesome. I was going to say the cool thing about the world of animals is like every continent, Every inch of this planet, for the most part, has some sort of a creature on it. And people often ask, like, you know, are you ever going to run out of episodes? I don't know if we ever run out of animals, maybe, but <laughs> I don't see that happening. And then if somehow we can find a way to get to another solar system or another planet, maybe I'll get to be the guy that goes there and, and looks at those creatures, too. <laughs> That's an amazing vision right there. Yeah, right? I appreciate your subtext of what you're saying, too, being there are so many things that we can learn about and appreciate in our own backyard, in our own neighborhood. And I think that's really important, too, because sometimes we feel like, oh, I have to go travel to an exotic location. But sometimes it's just about being aware and paying attention. And what I love so much about what you do is really bringing that joy down to what is right in front of you, like what is near you. And obviously you all are doing these incredible journeys to bring that to people through YouTube. Mm -hmm. But I really appreciate that idea of focus on what's in front of you. Right. You know, even an animal that you would think doesn't deserve any time in the spotlight deserves time in the spotlight. Each and every animal that lives on our planet deserves to at least have its few minutes of, you know, what we call brave wilderness fame, where we share it with the world because you never know what little boy or little girl out there or even an adult may be like, I've never heard of that animal. This is super interesting. And then they go to the library or they search on the internet. And before you know it, it's their favorite animal. And that's kind of how it happened for me as a kid. And every time we come across the new, strange, bizarre creature that somebody didn't know about, it's just another young mind that we can influence to get interested in the world of animals and the outdoors. Would you share a book or a quote that has changed the direction of your life in some way? Wow, sure. That's a great question. That's never been asked before. You know, I don't read as much as I used to, only in the sense that I'm so busy all the time. I don't get to really dive into a book too often. I'm actually writing a book right now, which has consumed a lot of my uh, free time for what would normally be reading. I mean, I would have to say that my favorite book of all time, though, is, is probably Jurassic Park. And I know everybody that watches shows like, Coyote loves Jurassic Park. He's always talking about Jurassic Park. But, you know, that book specifically for me just allowed my mind to go on such an adventure in my imagination. And I mean, I had read Jurassic Park before Spielberg even made the movie. So when it came out, I mean, you know, Michael Crichton's original book was just so visionary. And I was so into dinosaurs at the time, like it just allowed me to, you know, embark upon an imagination in my own world. I used to actually spend a lot of time as a kid out in the woods behind my house, pretending I was in Jurassic Park. So I would run around in the woods, pretending to see dinosaurs and trying to like evade them seeing me and like all sorts of stuff like that. So it was real early Coyote Peterson developmental days that Jurassic Park influenced, I guess. That's so cool. And you recently got to meet Jeff Goldblum. Bloom, right? 
which was just like this full circle perfect <laughs> i mean for for me to go on a late night show for the first time and to actually get to meet jeff goldblum who's like i wouldn't say a childhood hero in like that i looked up to him like an athlete but he was in like my dream movie, you know, so whether to meet him or Sam Neill was like the two tops on my list. I mean, if you could have said pick two people in the world you might want to meet, I would put Steven Spielberg and Jeff Goldblum up in the top five. So, yeah, that was pretty amazing. How was that for you being on Conan? Was that in terms of just your own experience of that? Did it feel normal and natural or was it like, wow, we've really come this far uh, one of the coolest experiences I've ever had is when you walk out from behind the curtains and you're in those bright lights and it's like, wow, like this is – I watch Conan. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I grew up watching Conan. I used to stay up way past my bedtime to watch his show. So um, when they had originally approached me and asked if I had done a late night show before, I said, I have not and I am I'm reserving – any other appearances to be here first with Conan. And, you know, we made a, a great relationship with their entire team. And, you know, I just have such an appreciation for the work that goes on behind the scenes at a late night show like that. Everybody's working so incredibly hard. And the experience that, you know, I went through that day was something I'll never forget. Hopefully I'll be on another late night show here soon. We're kind of already talking with them about some other ideas for later this year. So I'd love to return if they'll have me. And it's, really different when it comes to being in front of the cameras in a setting like that as compared to out in the wild. But I don't really get nervous. So, you know, I was jittery or anything behind the scenes before I went out there. And I just tried to go out and have a good time and do some things that people probably didn't expect. And I think it was rather engaging. And I know at least after the show, Conan and Jeff both pulled me aside and said, you know, give me some really kind words about my performance that night. So that meant a lot to me. That's so cool because, I mean, not only are you able to have that experience of meeting people that you have watched and admired, but you got to share your passion with them in like right. a very real way. And <laughs> that's really awesome. What an amazing experience. Right. Yeah, it was pretty neat. <laughs> Coyote, thank you so much for being with us today. Would you mind sharing with our audience where they can find out more about you and your work? Sure, absolutely. All you need to do is go on the internet and search Brave Wilderness. That should take you to our YouTube channel. Or if you go to anything that's at Coyote Peterson, that's all of my social media and you can find us there. That's right. And if you want to see some amazing photos, follow Coyote on Instagram and you will get plenty of his face between the jaws of some remarkable animal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you so much, Coyote. Hey, Ivy Blake, thank you guys both for having me on the podcast today and hope to be back on it again in the future. We have a free gift for you, hot off the virtual presses. If you go to motivationalmillennial.com slash free gift, you can get your very own personal transformation guide that illustrates the four limiting beliefs that we commonly have as millennials and eight motivational tools to overcome them. So... Go to motivationalmillennial.com. That's millennial, M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L.com slash free gift. Oh! <laughs> Welcome back to our after show. What? Is that too weird? Was that supposed to be a coyote? How? Oh! <laughs> Ow! Oh! Is that too weird? Yeah, of course it's weird. You're kind of weird. But is it too weird? I don't know. What's too? Okay. Well, <laughs> it means, it means many it. things, but no one on the internet knows <laughs> how to spell any of them. So we'll just say that. It was too, T-W-O weird. There were two weirds there. <laughs> too weird. Anyway, welcome to our after show of our conversation with Coyote Peterson, the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> beast oh. mode. Yeah, he was incredible to talk to. He Just was. so much energy and passion. Yeah. I am so impressed by his storytelling power, both in the conversation we just had and also in his show itself, because what he really is tapped into is how much stories affect us and draw us in. Mm -hmm. You know, because he could just do each of his things like, hey, here's an animal. Here's some facts about it. But... So much of what he does is about the journey and the process and learning. And it really inspires me to think about is how can I and we, meaning all of us, take what we love and what we care about and make it into an interesting story. 
I think I've seen that work especially with our motivational assemblies in the schools because we can sit there and talk to the kids about the growth mindset and how your neurons grow and get stronger, which we do. We explain the science of it. But then what we do is I tell them about my 92-year-old grandmother learning how to beatbox, and they're so enraptured by the whole story of grandma saying, what are you doing these days? And then doing boots and cats and boots and cats. So I think these stories have two big components and impacts. First, on ourselves to help make sense of what we've learned and to be able to share with other people. And secondly, the other people are so interested when things are told as a story than just when we're dropping facts or figures on their heads. And I think his Coyote's success of his YouTube channel and everything is really a testament to that draw that people are obviously interested in his intense interaction with animals, but also in the journey and the way he describes it to them. I'm thinking about the story in my own life and how I am always telling stories when I am sharing things with my friends and whatnot. But I think that sometimes I have this tendency to tell too many details. Like, so you're laughing, you know what I'm talking about. Like, I am I'm trying to, like, paint this picture, right? I'm really trying to paint a picture. Like, you're reading a book or something. I don't know. I just want you to have all the context. And I think that there's just something there about, like, if we really literally sat there and watched, like, every single piece of footage that Coyote's team had, we would just, like, get super bored, too, you know? Yeah. Like, you would still be getting the behind the scenes, but there would just be too much. Editing is a real skill and a very important skill to storytelling. That's right. right. But I'm thinking about, like, how does that apply to us and how we view ourselves and our identities? And I think... You know, if we're crafting an empowering story or if we're taking what we learned and experienced and narr- like you're talking about, telling a good story out of it, it's like it sort of forces us to really get to the heart of what's important about what our experience was. Yes. And so it's not just about telling the whole experience, but that can be, I mean, literally all the details of the experience, <laughs> but what was the most important thing? And that focusing on what's the most important, what's the heart of this, whether it's storytelling or it's an experience that we had or we're trying to, you know, be vulnerable or share our feelings with people, getting to the heart of what's most important, I think is really, really key. Yeah. And part of that sometimes is from telling the story a few times and seeing what people respond to, especially if it's an important story to you or the story of yourself, for example, like I'm thinking of my America's Got Talent audition story, which by this point I've probably told over a hundred, maybe two hundred times. I've heard it so many. I know. I'm so sorry. So you've, you've many You've really times. been overexposed. <laughs> you, you could probably, sometimes Ivy starts to like tell it to me. It's really funny to think about what things she remembers from it. But it's true. The initial version of that story was probably up to 30 minutes sometimes in the telling of it because it was all the details. It was going through all of the early rounds and what I said in the freestyles and how the producer responded. And then when I was before the panel of producers and they asked me to rap about their lawyer and, you know, but what I really realized was the core of the story is about the hope, the struggle, the fear of rejection Mm -hmm. and that sense of, almost there and oh defeat but then what can I learn from this how can I transform this and let it transform me and my experience of the world and when I realized that that's the emotional heart of it and a lot of this was with your coaching and editing help we stripped away all the things that weren't important and sometimes we add them back in because they're funny or they're nice details but when we get to the essence of the story you just see it. The entire room stays enraptured through the whole thing, like basically holding their breaths the entire time. I think that this principle can really be applied to interpersonal relationships, though, and like interpersonal communication, because one of the things that I learned, I would love to say early on, but it wasn't necessarily early on. I mean, I was <laughs> I was in my mid-20s, but I mean, relatively early on, I guess, is that In a romantic partnership, there are struggles and challenges and things that, like, can really frustrate you. And I noticed that if I went to go tell my partner what I was frustrated about without actually thinking about what the core issue was, then you're just, like, you know, ranting about some specific thing. Like, rather than (laughs) what about that specific thing really 
was hurtful to me or, Mm -hmm. you know, did I feel I wasn't being heard or, you know, that's the core of it Mm -hmm. and not thinking about all of the exact details, but what is really the core of what you're saying? I mean, in coaching relationships as well. I mean, that's one of the things that I try to help train the people I'm working with, you know, in a way to get used to not so much storytelling, but more like getting to the heart of what it is that they're trying to convey or what's the most important thing about what they're wanting to share. And I think that that skill can just make things a lot more, I don't know, deeper, I guess, in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially too with people's limited attention spans and everything else, I think it can be really important to focus on what is the core. So what else did you enjoy from the conversation with Coyote? Well, I just was really enjoying his intense passion Mm -hmm. because it was so genuine you know and no matter what we talked about like he always went back to his passion like he always went back to the energy that he had and I just remember thinking this dude has no fear I mean I'm sure you know he says I don't get nervous and I asked him he was talking about going to this wolverine and I'm like (laughs) I mean if it was wolverine you know from x-men I would want to yeah, get into a, a cage in there but anyway <laughs> I'm just kidding. but like you know like a like a wild wolverine and he's like no I was like not really nervous you know I imagine there are other things in life that you know he may be nervous about but certainly some of the crazy things that he's doing and the thing that is like he's so passionate about so excited about it's like it's obliterating his nervousness it's like mm-hmm. obliterating his fear and then what's left is just this clarity and confidence and exhilaration. And like, I'm just like, I want to join your crew. I'll bring <laughs> snacks. I don't know. I'll bring motivation. <laughs> Hi, this is Ivy. She's director of snacks and motivation. Uh. <laughs> I love how snacks comes first. Of course. Snacks. <laughs> if you're hangry, you the can't hear mover. any of the motivating That's exactly words. Right. <laughs> you need to. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, well, and that's a great reminder, too, that passion is so important because he is doing something that he loves for a career, and at the same time, it's really hard. I mean, listening to him talk about those shoots where they're going through the jungle or just being scorched in the desert and getting cut up and everything, not even just intentionally for the animals, which... It's a whole other level, (laughs) but just the fact that it's hard, like doing these shoots is really hard. And it made me remember that so often we idealize people who are doing what they love and following their dream, but every single person's path Mm. has a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. And what it was a good encouragement for me to do was to just look at what are the challenges on my path right now and really embrace them and be like, hey, this is part of what comes with doing this work that we think is really important and that we love. And so I'm wondering for you, as you were listening to him talk about those challenges, were you relating that in any way to your own life? And aside from obviously being inspired to bring them snacks and motivation, which I think is very, (laughs) is a great life goal. I don't know. I mean, maybe not in that exact moment, because I think that I was just so excited about his passion that I just was like, there with him you know I was totally just like that sounds so awesome even though he's like literally like this was grueling and I'm like awesome you know (laughs) so I think if you love something so much that even the hardest part of it still sounds awesome to people like that's really inspiring Mm -hmm. and you know I hope that that's something that we can create because yeah there are challenges to entrepreneurship there are challenges to building your own practice and to putting yourself out there. But it's like, if we can get to where we have so much passion just pouring out of us, like we feel invincible and that people hear that. Not that we are, but he's like, there are a lot of challenges that it's just totally worth it is like the subtext. Yeah. And when he's talking about kids and families watching the video and commenting and everything, that's such a good reminder too, that if you are focusing on the impact that you're having all of those challenges are worth it. Because, you know, thinking about how he's having to hold these creatures so that they can get the close-up shot, and part of it is, like he's saying, to hold it still to comfort and make the creature Mm -hmm. feel okay. But also, part of it is it takes a real commitment that he's saying, 
I wanna make sure this is the best experience for our viewers possible, so I'm gonna go the extra mile to make sure we get the great shot or that we get into the right location. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, speaks to his professionalism and the craft and the commitment to the viewer or user experience. And that's really inspiring to me, too, when I think about how can I with the content that we make or speeches and workshops that we deliver, really keep that user experience front and center, even if it takes more work and more effort and maybe seems disproportionate to the amount of impact it might have. Gosh, especially with the kind of work that we're doing. We can't know the kind of impact. Unless, mm -hmm. I mean, people explicitly tell us, but you, know, you can't know what that third grader is experiencing and what you're saying might be affecting them. So it's interesting too, because sometimes you've just got to have a lot of faith in that what you're putting out there and creating is having a strong impact. Yeah. And I think if you are conscious of the way you're doing that, it can really help. Like I'm thinking for a specific example of like using nonviolent communication in speeches. So one of the things we try to do is never make the students wrong when mm -hmm. they're answering questions. Also, we're very conscious about gender usage. So always making sure that things are either equal or not gender specific when we use them or when we're selecting volunteers, making sure there's equal distribution in terms of students who are selected to participate in things. And so all of those little things, I don't know that anyone really notices them at the time, <laughs> but I think it's important for us to put more of what we want out into the world. And so if we take the care and the time and the attention to focus on them, hopefully the cumulative effect over time will make a difference. Like erosion. Or evolution. <gasps> Eroding away the saboteur voices and evolving into the truest version of yourself. <laughs> yes, you are the phoenix. <laughs> like Coyote Peterson rise. Okay, I do some weird metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> then he's like a coyote and a bird. That's right. And <laughs> he's a hybrid. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. What a great conversation. Thank you so much for having that great conversation with me. And thank you to everyone who is listening. We hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Coyote Peterson. And please reach out and let us know if you want to go to motivationalmillennial.com. You can check out even more of our work, but you can also find our contact information so that you can let us know what's working for you, what you'd like to see improved or changed. And if you have anyone that you want to see on the show, just let us know as well. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Peace and love. We'll catch you next week on the Motivational Millennial Podcast. Bye. For show notes and upcoming guests, or to learn more about Coactive Coaching, the blog, and our other awesome offerings, visit MotivationalMillennial.com. Keep in touch with us at Facebook.com slash Motivational Millennial. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email with your thoughts, comments, and suggestions at podcast at motivationalmillennial.com. And tell us who you might like to hear from, or if you think you or anyone you know would be good for the show. The Motivational Millennial Podcast is edited by Christy Hostler and Team Podcast. Our theme music was composed and performed by Blake Brandis. Have, Have a great, great week, Motivational, motivational Millennials! millennials.